Hello and welcome to Speaking Week and this final session which today is focusing on dentists, physiotherapists and speech pathologists. Um, so if you're joining this session and I've seen in the chat that some of you are and this isn't your profession then please do stay. There's still going to be some very interesting things to learn. Um, and we're also going to make uh, recordings of the other three sessions earlier this week available on our YouTube channel at the start of next week. We're also going to email those replay links to anyone who registered for any of our webinars. So uh, you'll definitely be able to watch the session that you would have preferred to uh, at a later date. Um, or if this is the session that you wanted to see and you're unable to stay for the whole of the session, uh, then it will also be possible for you to see the recording later. Hello also to those tuning in on Facebook. So make sure you register via the link provided to continue watching. In today's session, I'm going to share a brand new roll card with you, which will also be uploaded to the sample test section of the OET website soon. And I'm going to share examples of candidates completing the role play with me from around the world. In the last couple of weeks, I've recorded role plays with 30 candidates from among the more than 5,000 who expressed interest in doing this. I would have loved to have spoken to even more candidates and I'm sure, sorry if you weren't one of those chosen. But what I am going to be able to do is use scripts from the role plays that I did record to demonstrate different strengths and weaknesses against the assessment criteria OET assessors use to mark your speaking test. So from those of you filling in um, the poll that I asked, I can see that we've got a few of all five of those professions. So we've got a few physiotherapists, a few dentists, speech pathologists, as well as uh, maybe one optometrist and a couple of podiatrists joining us today. So it's really good to see you, but just to uh, reassure that if you aren't one of those uh, professions, I think you'll still find today pretty interesting, especially the first part of the session where I'm going to go through um, the speaking assessment criteria um, and give you some examples of what the assessors are looking for. So do hang around um, and I'm sure you're going to find something of use for you. I'm going to start off by asking you a few poll questions um, and this way I can find out a little bit more about um, your practice and where you might have um, some need for extra support. So this first question is about um, the materials that OET make available to all candidates uh, to help with their speaking test. Uh, so these are free and available to you from OET and these include our speaking masterclass, a sample speaking test which we've given some feedback on available on our YouTube page, as well as the profession specific video on how to approach speaking sample test three, which uh, we added to our website um, a month or so back. So let me know which ones you have used. That's great. So over half of you have used um, our speaking masterclass. Not that many have looked at um, the uh, profession specific video on the approach to the speaking sample test. And we have one of these for all 12 of the professions. So if you haven't already seen that video, um, after this session, I would head over to the OET website to our preparation portal. You can see the link on the screen now. And those arrows direct you to where you can specifically find those three pieces of material that I've just mentioned, um, as well as lots of other um, free uh, official resources that you can use. All right, so question number two. Uh, is about how often you practice patient conversations. Um, so this means um, having a sort of role play conversation, either um, as a role play practice or be perhaps because you're working with real patients. So um, is this something that you do very regularly um, or is this something that you don't actually have opportunity to practice even though perhaps you are speaking in English regularly? All right, so the responses there are pretty even, um, although I would say that um, the 
the most most of you 40 percent are saying you don't uh, have anyone to practice patient conversations with um so my advice there would be um, if you are working with patients in English, and obviously you're really lucky in having multiple practice opportunities, but if you don't, there are still ways to practice conversations with patients without actually having a patient to practice with. And it just requires a bit of time from your colleagues or friends or family members. And in the video approaching speaking sample test three, which I mentioned um, in the previous slide, I explain how you can do this um, even without having an official roll card to practice with. So that's another reason to check out that video if you haven't seen it already. And then my final question is about the speaking assessment criteria. So this one, um, and please feel free to be honest, um, this one is about whether you have, um, you're familiar with the speaking assessment criteria um, or this is something that you have never seen, you haven't looked, so you don't really know what they are. That's pretty standard. So two thirds of you, and this has been what I've seen uh, for most of the week, um, most uh, of you two thirds are saying that um, I know uh, a general idea about the assessment criteria. But 20% of you very honestly said, um, I haven't seen them. And this is something that I want to fix in today's session uh, because the assessment criteria, which are up on the screen now, are so important to your success on test day. After all, this is a language test and you're only going to score the grade you want if you can evidence each of the assessment criteria to a high level. If you're not sure what the criteria are or what the assessors are looking for, this is something that you need to fix. And this session today is going to be a good start, but I'd really encourage all of you to go to the link uh, which you can see on the screen now and make sure that you either download the criteria or save them to your favorites or perhaps even print them off, stick them on the wall. Ideally, do the same for the writing assessment criteria, which are also on our website under the writing section uh, rather than speaking as you can see on the link here because having a good understanding for both speaking and writing of what the assessors are looking for is going to be really important to help you score the grade that you want. Now to score a B grade in your speaking test which is the score most of you are aiming at you will need to score mostly fives from the linguistic criteria and two which is competent user from the clinical communication criteria. And I'm going to spend the next part of this session looking in more detail at what that means for your speaking performance. Now for the speech pathologists joining the session, I know that you're aiming for an A grade. So while what I am going to focus on is to look at the level for five and two, that's still going to be true for you. But you need to also perhaps look when you have your speaking assessment criteria in front of you at some of the um, step above. So some of the sixes um, and also some of the threes, because you're likely to need to score a six or a three in some of those areas so that you're getting uh, an A grade. So that's a little bit different if you're a speech pathologist. For the other professions, you're all really aiming at a B grade. So let's go through each of the criteria in turn. So the first of these criteria is intelligibility, which means your speech is easily understood with what is called minimal strain for the listener. My best way of explaining what strain looks like is the expression you can see on the emoji on the screen, a sort of confused, puzzled look. But the patient or interlocutor might not always show this on their face. Um, it, it would be a little bit impolite uh, to sit there as the patient with that expression. So instead, they might have a neutral expression, but internally, their mind is going to be turning, trying to understand what you have said. Another indicator that there is strain is if the interlocutor doesn't answer the question as you expect. Perhaps they just say yes 
This is something we do in English when we know we've been asked a question, but we haven't understood it and we don't like to ask what you have meant. The other part of intelligibility is to do with your accent and pronunciation. And it's absolutely fine to have an accent. Um, but if it's a very heavy accent or you have significant pronunciation errors for the task that you're completing, that would reduce your score here for intelligibility. So let's look at um, an example of intelligibility. So here it is a physiotherapist and the physio is providing a summary of the patient's recovery process. Unfortunately, as you can see on line four, a number of the words are unintelligible, partly because they are unfamiliar to the patient, but also because of the candidate's speed and pronunciation. This is something to be aware of, especially when you are using technical terms, which is what this physiotherapist was doing for those words. And in fact, the thing about technical language, as we'll probably touch on a little bit later, is are they actually appropriate to use in the first place or do you need to change it into patient language? So for fluency, this means that you are fluent at normal speed and any hesitation is due to the natural process of thinking and speaking at the same time. So you may occasionally repeat yourself or self-correct what you have just said, but the amount of this wouldn't confuse the patient. And the words normal speed are really important here because of course, your normal speed may be different depending on what you are discussing with the patient. So as an example, imagine that you are explaining a process to a patient or giving them results of a test. Would you talk about these at the same speed as you would when asking them questions or answering a routine question that they ask you? No, you need to make sure your speed is appropriate for the content that you are discussing. So here's another example, this time from a different physiotherapist. Um, and this one's quite an interesting one. So often candidates can be so fluent or comfortable to speak for extended terms that they don't actually include the patient enough in the conversation. And that has its own problems. But in this example, the physio has the opposite problem. She's not managing the conversation, which as you know, in OET, the role play, um, the professional is expected to manage the conversation and move things forward. Instead, what you can see from the example here is that the physio is relying on the patient, asking her questions and then providing quite brief answers. And then, you know, there's a pause and so the patient asks another question. That's not a good example of fluency. In appropriateness of language, your level of formality, the tone of your voice and the vocabulary you choose need to be mostly appropriate for the scenario you're discussing. And formality may be different depending on whether you've met this patient before, according to the background information, the age of the patient or their healthcare needs. And similarly, you need to use different tone of voice when you are showing empathy or reassurance to when you are firmly advising the patient to do something. And similarly, your vocabulary choices are also linked to the function of what you are discussing. So you'll use different words depending on whether you're advising, asking questions or reassuring. Occasional mistakes in these areas are okay, but overall you need to match the three things well to the role play. And here's an example from a speech pathologist. This speech pathologist has moments in their response when her language is very appropriate. So for example, when she's explaining what some of the management strategies are in the middle of the response, including about uh, one type of posture modification. But at other times, um, for example, on line four, she uses technical terms the patient might not understand, such as vocal folds or larynx. Or a little bit later, um, 
she also mentions the word aspiration, four lines from the bottom. And again, the um, patient may not be familiar with that word. And so to make it more appropriate, the speech pathologist should change those words uh, into ones that the patient would be more familiar with, or perhaps check or define um, those words for the patient. In resources of grammar and expression, you are able to show the assessors that you can be flexible with English, that you have the grammar and vocabulary necessary for this situation and respond to the patient. And this means things like demonstrating different tenses, conditional forms, maybe phrasal verbs, the occasional colloquial or idiomatic phrase. But it's important that you don't think of them as a tick list, that you can simply tick off when you have used them once per role play. Instead, like the images you can see on the screen, uh, think of them more like a filing cabinet, which you download whenever you need them and as many times as you need them. Occasional mistakes are okay, but in general, they shouldn't prevent your meaning from being clear or the conversation from continuing smoothly. So in this example from the physiotherapist, uh, despite the physio having quite a few errors and repetitions in their response, as well as one unintelligible word, his overall meaning can be followed by the patient. However, if the whole of his role play was like this, his score for this criterion would definitely be impacted. Let's look now at the clinical communication criteria. And there is quite a bit of misunderstanding about these. So compared to other English tests you may be familiar with, these are not criteria you will have been tested on before. You're used to demonstrating all of the linguistic criteria, which are the four criteria we've already looked at. And you'll have been familiar with those even before you reached testing standards. So for example, while you're learning English at school, for example. But not being familiar with these criteria is no excuse. Um, they aren't weighted so highly as the linguistic criteria. So these ones are marked out of three rather than out of six, but there are five of them and it's pointless to throw away scores. Another misunderstanding candidates have about these clinical communication criteria is that they are assessing your medical knowledge. Um, and this isn't true, probably because of the word clinical in the title, candidates think this, but it's not true. These are communication criteria in a clinical context, or in other words, important communication skills which healthcare providers need, which are separate to the actual medicine that they are discussing. We're going to go through each of them one by one, so that should help you understand what I mean. So the first one is relationship building. And the ways you can evidence this is by starting the role play appropriately, perhaps using introductions where needed or a greeting, and then maybe establishing the purpose of the conversation. Showing respect for the patient and their situation, as well as not judging their opinions or attitude towards their health is also important. Even if part of your task is to try and change that attitude during the role play. You also need to show empathy for the situation the patient describes or what they tell you, both in the words that you say and in the tone of voice that you use in your responses. These approaches to the conversation will then help the patient feel like you are on their side, that you understand them and that you will work with them as a team to address their health needs as best you can. Here in this example, the speech pathologist starts with a friendly greeting to the patient and an open question to hear from the patient what the reason is for their visit. The second criteria is understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective. And this means asking the patient to tell you about what is worrying them or what they feel comfortable to do or if they tell you this information without you needing to ask them, you need to ask follow-up questions to make sure you fully understand or respond in a way to show you've listened. 
And one way you can do this is including some of what you say in your response or perhaps later in an explanation that you give um, a bit afterwards in the conversation. It also means noticing how the patient answers your questions or tells you information. Do they use language to show they feel uncomfortable, anxious or embarrassed? Or perhaps do they use words that sound like they agree, but from the tone of their voice show that they don't really? So, for example, maybe or I suppose so. Here in this example, the dentist um, or sorry, the patient is telling the dentist that they don't like the idea of the treatment that the dentist has suggested. And the dentist explores why this is the case by asking the patient to explain why they feel this way and then include some of the patient's response in their explanation about the other option there is, but also why the first suggestion is the better one. So the patient um, says when they explain, it sounds painful, I don't really understand it. And the dentist picks up on the pain in the second part of her second response. So um, everybody is afraid of pain during dental procedures. I can reassure you that I will numb the area. For providing structure, this means taking responsibility for the conversation and the content you want to discuss with the patient. So as I mentioned earlier, as expected by OET, you need to manage the conversation and providing structure is the way that you evidence this. And there are a number of different ways you can do it, including signposting that one discussion point has finished and a new one is starting by naming the new point you want to start talking about or you can check if the patient requires any clarification before introducing a new point. Or another alternative is just to make a clear pause and an intake of breath to show a change of direction. Other organization techniques including, include offering a summary of a process or what has been agreed, or by adding intensifying language such as really important or essential that you do this, uh, which will help the patient understand what is more important from less important information or advice that you're giving them. So here, the speech pathologist uh, is providing a summary of what she and the patient have been discussing, which was actually whether the patient should have speech pathology or surgical measures. She mentions uh, just to recap, to introduce her summary. And this is a good point to mention that you can provide a summary in the middle of the conversation as this speech pathologist does, did, sorry. And that can be an effective way of completing one task. A summary doesn't just have to be something that happens at the end of a conversation. In information gathering, these skills are all about assisting the patient to be part of the conversation. It may seem a little counterintuitive in a speaking test that you should be encouraging the patient to talk more, but it's important that there should be a balance. Of course, it's rare when we are speaking to another person that we do all the speaking and they do all the listening. In real life, and certainly with patients, speaking is a two-person process and we can complete the conversation more effectively if the other person is actively involved in it. To do this, you need to give the patient opportunities to speak by asking open questions first, so they tell you the situation in their own words before then clarifying what they've told you using closed questions. You also need to, when they are speaking, show that you are listening by not interrupting and providing encouragement through sounds like, uh-huh, hmm, right and then responding using some of what they told you or giving a summary of what you have understood. It means making sure you've understood what they said by asking for clarification when it's unclear, or as we looked at before, when their words suggest one thing, but their tone means another. It also means avoiding asking compound questions, or in other words, two or three questions in one. And I've got an example for you for that on the next slide. But just before we go to that, you should also avoid leading questions, which suggest the answer to the patient rather than letting them answer it in their own way. 
So for example, um, you have had this uh, pain before, haven't you? It's really suggesting that the patient is going to answer yes. You're feeding them the answer before they've given it or without giving them the option really to choose their own answer. So as I mentioned, um, this speech pathologist um, is does the right thing by preparing the patient that she wants to ask her a few questions. But then she asks compound questions, which is something that should be avoided. Um, so you can see that she says, um, can you tell me a little bit more about the problem? How has it affected your daily life, the difficulties you face or when it has started? And that's quite difficult for the patient to respond to. They don't know which one to respond to first. Uh, and so it can give them that sort of strained look that we talked about earlier in the session. And the final uh, clinical criteria is information giving. And by contrast to information gathering, this is about how you speak and provide information in those parts of the conversation where you need to do this. So for example, when explaining options, giving advice and so on, but it's also still focusing on how you include the patient in these sections. So for example, by finding out how much the patient knows already about the topic, so you're not giving them unnecessary information, checking the patient has understood and that you've provided sufficient detail for them to feel clear, and asking them explicitly if they feel comfortable with what you have said, and if not, to feel safe to share their concerns with you. Pausing is really important here. And you must remember that the situation you're discussing with the patient is likely to be the first time they've heard it. And if you rush through everything, they're going to miss important details or just end up feeling worried and confused. So watch their face. This is a good indicator of whether they are relaxed because they are following what you're saying or feeling stressed because you're providing the information too quickly. Here, the physio is providing some reassurance about the patient's recovery and at the end checks that what he has said is clear so that he can provide further detail if needed. So this is a good example of giving some information, including some reassurance, and then to check, is that clear? Does the patient need more detail at the end? So now we've gone through each of the assessment criteria with some examples. I want to share with you five top tips that came out of completing the role plays in the last couple of weeks with those 30 candidates. So tip number one is how you start the conversation is really important. If you're not clear, you should definitely ask during the preparation time. And make sure you read the background information carefully for clues and then use that when you decide how to start the conversation. My second top tip is don't rush. So the conversation is more important than completing all of the tasks. This is after all supposed to be a real patient and they need to understand and be included in the decision making process. It's not just about completing all of the tasks. It's much more important to have an effective conversation, uh, particularly for OET purposes. Tip number three is about the information which is provided in brackets on your roll card, which you should understand is optional. And if you decide that you want to use it because it provides you a good example of how to explain something to the patient, then you need to understand that you may need to alter the language from the information in brackets or think about how or when you say it to keep the patient feeling comfortable. Tip number four is don't add to the tasks. So even if your healthcare training tells you to take a complete history or ask additional questions, if it's not on the card, you don't need to do that for the purposes of OET. And finally, as we've already seen a couple of times, if you use healthcare terminology, make sure you explain it to the patient and check that they are familiar with it and use lay language wherever possible. So for the second part of the session, I'm going to focus on conversations that I recorded in the past two weeks. And I was able to record conversations with some physiotherapists, dentists, and speech pathologists. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each of those professions using examples from our recordings. <clears throat> 
Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a podiatrist or an optometrist to record with. So if you are one of those professions today, hopefully you can still learn from the general advice that comes with the examples and you will still get your own roll card to practice with from our sample test page, uh, which will be available um, on Monday on the website. And also we're going to email to all candidates that registered um, during today. So I'm going to start with the speech pathology card and I've picked out some important details um, on this slide here. You can see highlighted. So the setting is a private clinic and the background information tells us that the patient is 31 years old and has a chronic progressive response for wanting, sorry, the patient's reasons for wanting surgery and task five, which gives details of how speech pathology can help and establish the patient's willingness to begin speech therapy. So to complete task one, uh, which is to confirm the reason for the patient's referral, a fairly simple question could be used. So as an example, can I just confirm your understanding of the reason for your visit today? Or perhaps you could be slightly more direct, for example, I can see from your notes that you've been diagnosed with swallowing difficulties or what we call dysphagia, and that's why your doctor has referred you. Is that right? The three speech pathologists that I um, recorded approach this task quite differently, uh, and you can see them on the screen uh, now. But the first one is a little awkward. Um, she struggles a little bit to phrase the question. Um, trying to find out from the patient what the reason for her um, referral is. And number three, the bottom right, actually talks about the patient's um, ALS diagnosis rather than the dysphagia. So that's also a little bit confusing. The second speech pathologist, top right, is most successful, but doesn't actually allow the patient an opportunity to confirm this is the reason for her visit. Um, and then for the second part of task one, um, you can see that all of the speech pathologists uh, managed to ask some questions to find out more details about the problem. So that was fine for all of them. But you'll remember that I pointed out that number two, top right, does use those compound questions, which you should really try to avoid. For task two, uh, two of the speech pathologists did this quite successfully. Um, so this was to explore the patient's reasons for wanting surgery. So the first speech pathologist on the left validates the patient's thinking. A lot of people do think, um, but then presents her opinion. Um, and the truth is that a lot of exercises, a lot of speech pathology related practices can also bring a lot of change. And she finishes her response by asking the patient why she is good, why she is keen to have surgery, which I have to say is a good technique and it's a good way to include the patient's perspective. It's quite a good idea when you're trying to find out from a patient why they don't want to do something to actually ask them, why is that that you don't want to do it? Or can I ask why you're not keen for that suggestion? The speech pathologist uh, on the right comes at it slightly less directly by starting off explaining the breadth of work that speech pathologists do before going on to explain why surgery is not preferred. The other speech pathologist, uh, though, wasn't so successful with this task. So she misses the patient's question, which is, I wasn't sure why the doctor referred me to a speech pathologist. And instead of um, doing this, provides an explanation um, of the adaptions that she can work on the patient with. And confusingly, she finishes her response by saying that they will have to start preparing the patient for getting surgery. So that wasn't a particularly successful, successful completion of the task. It's really important to pick up on queries that the patient's asking and responding to them. And uh, for task five, uh, the candidates had to give details of how speech pathology can help. And only two of the speech pathologists had time for this task. Uh, 
The other one had spent um, a little bit too long building up a history of the patient's condition, which had actually been given in the background information and it wasn't one of the tasks. Um, but of the other two responses that you can see, uh, the candidate on the left covered it in quite some detail and provides information about the strategies. Um, however, she, although providing more detail, she doesn't um, give any explanation about the techniques or muscle strengthening exercises, which may have been a bit vague uh, for the patient and is perhaps why the patient picks up about the diet modification, which is obviously a concern for her. The speech pathologist follows the patient in this case um, and sets their concern as a priority in her final response before bringing it back round to the other techniques uh, that uh, they can discuss. The speech pathologist on the right uh, was probably running out of time a little bit here and provided the details as a list, which were in appropriate language to the patient. So it was an okay start to this task. And if they'd had more time, uh, would have been good to see how she built those out um, into more detail. Let's move on now to dentistry. So here on the dentistry card, you can see that the setting is a suburban dental clinic. And the background information tells us that the patient is 22 years old and a semi-professional basketball player who has tooth pain from his, his or her upper left lateral incisor. It says that you've just examined the patient and found that the tooth is loose and that there is swelling and inflammation of the gums indicating infection. There are five tasks again on the card and I'm going to focus on task one, explain the findings of your examination. Task three, give information about alternatives to root canal therapy and recommend root canal therapy. And task five, which is explain the recovery process and establish the patient's consent to get an x-ray taken. So I have to say, neither of the two dentists I spoke to really made the most of the background information that they were given, which made the start of the role plays a little bit awkward. So remember, as we just saw on the roll card, it said that you have just examined the patient. But we can see that the dentist on the left uh, starts by asking um, or saying, sorry, nice to meet you. How can I address you? How can I help you today? Um, which isn't a good match for when the roll card says you've just examined the patient. Um, the second dentist was slightly weaker still because this dentist started off by saying, how can I help you? But then also said, can I have a look at the tooth rather than mentioning that the examination had already happened. And that's a good learning point, I think, for all professions. If it says in the background information that you've just completed an examination, uh, then you don't have to make mention of it as something, can I do it now? You, it has already happened. And so you can refer to it in the past tense. For task three, I want to get your opinion in the chat box. Um, so this task was to give alternatives to root canal therapy and recommend root canal therapy. So the two different dentists have a look at how they manage these and let me know whether you think the left option or the right option uh, was more successful in giving alternatives to root canal therapy and recommending root canal therapy. Which one do you think was better, left or right? So we've got somebody saying left. Anybody else want to suggest? Yet yeah, someone else is saying the left one, left. Yep. 
Yeah, good. So I can see uh, most of you are saying that the left um, option is more successful, and I agree with you. So the, this dentist provides a neutral description of the alternative to root canal therapy, but then explains that this isn't what she would recommend um, and provides a couple of reasons for this and then returns to the source of discomfort the patient has mentioned, which is the pain and why she's reluctant about the idea of root canal therapy. So it's quite a compact response. And then at the end of that says, is that okay? The second dentist mentions from the start that there are two options. And after the patient has said they're not very keen um, about the root canal therapy, uh, she mentions the other option is extraction. Um, but you can tell this isn't her preference because um, she says not really. Um, uh, and then she confirms at the end of her response uh, that root canal is her recommendation. This dentist uh, lacked a little bit of confidence and fluency. She was still quite new to OET. So the shortness of her responses made this a little bit less successful completion of this task. Finally, let's have a look at task five uh, and we can see something similar here. Um, the dentist on the right is really relying on the patient to ask questions for her to respond to rather than leading and managing the conversation, which we saw in providing structure, one of the assessment criteria is really important. The dentist on the left again covers the task quite neatly, explaining the recovery process and giving details which the patient would want to know. So for example, you will feel some pain, but I will give you some painkillers, try to av avoid quite hot food. So very kind of patient-centered information. And then at the end, um, gathers the patient's consent to take an x-ray. So let's also look at physiotherapy. So for the physiotherapy task, um, the setting is a hospital outpatient clinic. And the background information tells us that the patient is a factory worker who sustained a twisting injury to their lumbar spine two weeks ago. And that this is a follow-up appointment to check on his or her progress with the exercises you prescribed. Again, as is pretty standard for OET cards, there are five tasks and I'm going to focus on task one. Find out how the patient has been managing with the exercise program. Task three, explain the purpose of these review appointments. And task five, resist giving a time scale for recovery and establish the patient's willingness to do the exercises. So a bit like the dentists, neither of these physiotherapists uh, did a great job of making use of the background information. So both physios introduced themselves to the patient uh, rather than saying something like, hello, it's good to see you again. Um, the second question in each case, um, on the left, how are you? Or on the right, how are you feeling today? Is more appropriate. Um, but remember that the roll card said this is a follow-up appointment. So introductions wouldn't have been necessary here. The physio on the left also did a better job of showing empathy for the patient's reasons why they hadn't done their exercises. Although I'm really sorry to hear that isn't probably the most natural response to what the patient has said. Possibly something like, that's a shame, but I understand that it's hard to exercise when you're in pain, would have been a bit more suitable here. He also didn't seem to understand the patient's response because he asked almost the same question again at the bottom of his um, part on the left. But the second physio didn't really show em any empathy at all. She did say, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, but it, she says that more than once. Um, and you can see also after the patient said that their back was sore and they were worried about doing more injury, she just says, oh, I see, which isn't really showing empathy and, and consequently sounds a little bit unfriendly. So again, let me get your thoughts um, on the next task. So this was task three, where the physios needed to explain the purpose of the review appointments. 
which of the physios do you think was more successful uh, at explaining why or what the purpose of the review appointments were? Do you think it was the physio on the left or the physio on the right? What do you think? There is a bit to read, I know, so it might just take you a minute to make a decision. Someone's saying neither, actually. Okay. Um, feel free to share a, an explanation why you think um, either left or right is better. Um, we've got a couple of people saying I think the right one is better. So Salman's saying, I don't think either of them explained it enough. Okay, thank you for that. Someone else coming in for the right. Yeah, a couple of you are saying the right. Yeah, so I would say probably neither of them were 100% successful. Um, so the physio on the left go sort of straight into an explanation of the different exercises. Now, sometimes physio cards will have this as a task to talk patients through an exercise. But on this card, um, the task was to explain the purpose of the review appointments. And in brackets, some suggestions of what to talk about were provided. And one of those suggestions was demonstrate exercises. So the physio just needed to say that they would do this, that they would demonstrate the exercise, but instead the um, physio at quite some speed just launches into an explanation of what the exercise was. And that was quite difficult to follow as the patient. And also things like a supine position, is that very familiar to patients? Perhaps on your back would be much more familiar and friendly to use. The physio on the right, again, uh, was giving quite short responses, which didn't make the conversation feel particularly comfortable. Um, and she could have done with elaborating on her explanation a bit more. And that would have also demonstrated um, better fluency. So you can see in her first response, she says, I'm going to demonstrate some exercises and I'll make sure you're doing them in a good way. It's a good answer, but it could be better if, for example, um, she'd said, I will demonstrate them to you while you watch me, and then you will try the exercises while I talk you through them and check your technique. So just adding a little bit more uh, would have improved that response on the right quite considerably. And for task five, which was to resist giving a time scale for recovery and establish the patient's willingness to do the exercises, the physios approached this quite differently. The first um, physio certainly resists the patient's first question about time scale in her response. Um, we'll see and I will tell you later. But when the patient pushes her to give a response, she then sort of crumbles and just says, oh, it will take around two weeks, rather than just sticking with the explanation of it will depend on patient to patient, which would have been uh, more in keeping with the roll card. The second physio is more reassuring and explains the step steps to recovery without giving an exact time scale. So I would say uh, that's better, that first part, but unfortunately, the second part of his explanation is quite difficult for the patient to understand. Um, so the first part, to resist giving the time scale, he did quite well, uh, but the second part um, was more confused and less successful. All right, so having now looked at some real candidate responses to the different roll cards, um, in summary, every candidate is going to have different strengths and weaknesses. And that comes to an extent from the different ways we speak. It's quite a personal thing, the way that we talk and interact with other people. So it's absolutely natural that different candidates would have different strengths and weaknesses and would approach tasks 
differently. There isn't one perfect way to communicate information. What is important is that you evidence the criteria. Um, so to make sure that you have an understanding of what the assessors are looking for is a really valuable part of your preparation. I can't really stress that enough. So making sure you're regularly looking at the assessment criteria and the level that you are aiming for um, to make sure that you are demonstrating those things is really critical to your success. Remember that OET is a language test, so you're not being judged on the accuracy of the medical information you provide, just the way that you communicate it in English. And finally, um, to remember that your assessment is across both role plays. So you do have the opportunity to make up for some weaknesses in the first role play when you're completing the second, or um, if you were weaker in the first, uh, second, sorry, but were stronger in the first, it could still balance out for you to get the grade that you're looking for. So for the last nine minutes, um, I'm happy to answer some questions that you might have about speaking. Um, perhaps particularly if you're one of the professions that I, I was focusing on today, but um, I'll also ask general speaking questions that apply to all the professions. Just to start off, um, I can see several of you have mentioned um, about wanting to have a recording either of today's webinar or one of the previous webinars. So anyone who registered for uh, one of the webinars this week will be receiving replay links to those webinars via email. And we'll also be making the webinars available to you um, on our YouTube channel next week. Uh, Salman says, how much do grammatical errors matter in speech? Um, so if you recall earlier in the session when I was looking at resources of grammar and expression, I was able to say that um, obviously some inaccuracies are fine um, and some amount of self-correction or hesitation won't uh, impact your score. But the assessors are looking at your performance overall. So if overall your grammar is a bit of a weakness, you're making multiple mistakes, or perhaps you're, you're showing only limited variety and flexibility with grammar, that can uh, impact your score. But they're certainly not counting how many mistakes you're making. They look at your performance overall across both of the roll cards. Jason says, are the tasks going to be provided to us for the test? So yes, that's absolutely right. When you take your test either on paper, at a venue or um, via computer on Zoom, you will have the roll card uh, that you practice, uh, sorry, that you complete throughout the time of the role play. So for the preparation time and the five minutes of the role play, you have that roll card to refer to. Um, Christine says, will the interlocutor recognize when I use US terms and phrases? My feeling is probably yes, particularly if you are taking the test in America. Um, but even if not, um, provided they're something fairly uh, patient centered, uh, they will understand it. Technical terms, whether it's an American technical term or a British Australian technical term is still going to be less clear to patients. So I would under I would uh, encourage you to use lay language or patient language uh, wherever possible. Um, Ginalyn is asking about speaking tests on the computer. So for computer tests, um, you have the roll card on the screen, which is how I recorded the conversations with these candidates for, for these webinars. Um, and you're allowed to have a piece of paper which you can make notes on um, during the preparation time. And then at the end of the preparation time, you need to hold that paper up uh, for the interlocutor to see, and then you'll um, destroy it after that. Che is saying, if the time is up and I haven't finished, what should I do? Keep talking to finish the conversation or stop immediately. It's a good question, but uh, you should just stop. So the assessors have to, sorry, the interlocutors have to end the conversation once you've reached five minutes. Um, and uh, at that point, if you try and continue talking, they will just ask you again to stop. Uh, Chippy 
It says, is there any need to include extra information? So there's certainly no need to add to the tasks that are on the role play. You can give some different examples, perhaps, to the ones that are given there in brackets. Um, but you shouldn't add to the tasks. Um, so if you are thinking, I want to ask more questions about something and it's not one of the tasks, then avoid doing that for your OET test. Uh, Sana says during the speaking test, in case we become blank due to nervousness, what can we do? So that certainly happened um, with one of the candidates that I was working with um, or completing a recording with. Uh, she lost the word that she wanted um, and she couldn't quite think of what the word uh, was. And so in, you could see her sort of hesitating and stumbling a bit. Um, and then she came up with a, an alternative way of saying it. So that's exactly what you should do. It can happen, obviously, particularly in a pressurized situation that you, you do go blank, you forget what you want to say. If you really can't think of a word, the best thing to do is uh, to say, um, sorry, my mind's gone blank, let's move on to the next task and I'll come back to it, which is something that we, we could do in real life because even um, when I'm having a conversation not OET related at all, there's a possibility that I lose the word that I'm thinking of and, and I have to come back to it. Um, Adrienne is saying, are speaking sample videos posted by OET examples of grade A? So, Adrienne, um, the sample videos that are on our YouTube channel uh, haven't specifically been assessed, but you will see that they come with um, some feedback on strengths and weaknesses. So I, I can't necessarily say what grade they are, but the feedback provided should give you an indication of how strong or weak the candidate is in each case. David says, if there are five tasks, is it okay to intentionally not include some of the tasks? No, I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um, you need to move through the tasks in order. Um, uh, it's fine if you don't have opportunity to complete all of the tasks, because as I said earlier, it's more important uh, that you have a successful conversation than you complete all of the tasks but you shouldn't intentionally skip any. Um, that would be considered a sign of weakness to the assessor that you have missed one out. Um, and they might have to assume that uh, you didn't have the language to complete that task um, because they don't have opportunity to find out from you what was happening. So move through the tasks in turn um, and don't worry too much if you haven't had time to answer all of the tasks. Um, Salman says, is it a plus point that the candidate talks more and the patient doesn't feel like asking questions? Not necessarily. I wouldn't say that it's a plus point. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, you as the healthcare professional must manage the conversation. So um, if the patient isn't um, asking very much, then you may um, provide more explanation. But you should always keep checking with the patient. Uh, did you understand? Can I clarify anything for you? You seem a little bit quiet about what I've said. Does anything concern you or something like that? So you should still be showing the assessor that you're attempting to include the patient uh, in your conversation. Um, MP says, if we have examined the patient, can we say directly, so John, after your examination, I have found you have a problem in your right knee joint, rather than starting with any greeting. Yes, absolutely you can. That is what I would recommend that you do, because it demonstrates that you have uh, understood the background information and um, you are completing the task successfully. All right, I have got um, one more question um, to answer and then we'll need to bring this session um, to a close. Um, Adrienne says, when we do speaking via computer test, would we have an interlocutor from Australia or from our country? 
Um, so for computer speaking tests, uh, your interlocutor may come from um, a variety of locations. So it won't necessarily be someone from your country, um, which is obviously the case if you are taking a paper-based test at a venue. All right, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure to complete these um, webinars this week for Speaking Week. Uh, as I've mentioned a few times now, um, if you'd like a recording of this webinar or any of the other webinars, they are going to be emailed to you uh, later on in the day, as well as the role play cards, so that you'll be able to uh, start accessing and practicing those yourselves. Have a good rest of your day. Keep safe and thank you so much for joining me. Bye.